Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Jen, if you can move forward to the next screen, uh, because I want to put this survey, we're, we're going to talk about um, a report. And at first, before we do that, I like to put it in a larger context. Uh, the title of this whole uh, webinar today is actually amusingly uh, provocative, uh, because we can also ask the question, why don't developers just always write proprietary software that's secure? Um, and it's clear from the endless vulnerability reports, endless updates, the proprietary developers haven't solved the problem of how to develop uh, perfectly secure software either. Um, that said, it's true that open source software has some potential advantages in developing uh, secure software. Uh, in particular, open source software can be peer reviewed by many, mass peer review. And that gives it a potential advantage. And there is, there, are, uh, there is open source software that's very secure, but unfortunately this potential is not always realized. And some have been saying for a very long time that while open source has potential security advantages, that doesn't automatically make it uh, more secure or perfectly secure or anything like that. And in that context, back in 2014, uh, the Hartley vulnerability in OpenSSL, uh, I think suddenly raised this issue for a lot of other people that who finally started paying attention to, wait a minute, we're using this all over the place. Some of it's quite secure, some of it's not. What do we do about that? Um, and this really brought attention the need for increased security um, in open source software. Um, at that time, it led to the foundation of something called the Core Infrastructure Initiative, the CII, uh, whose task was to fund and improve critical elements of open source software, including OpenSSL. It established something called the CII Best, Back, uh, Best Practices Badging Program, uh, which we may talk about later. Uh, two project censuses, trying to figure out, well, what are the most important open source projects? And what we're going to be talking about today is the uh, 2020 FOSS Contributor Survey. Next. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> more recently, uh, this has also led to the, this issue has led to the foundation of something called the Open Source Security Foundation, the Open SSF. Uh, that was uh, formally established, announced on August 3, so that's uh, quite recent. And this is a consolidation of many different organizations, many different uh, folks working together to improve the security of open source software. And so it brings in the Core Inf Infrastructure Initiative, the Open Source Security Coalition, the Joint Open Source Software Initiative. Um, <clears throat> a couple of the members are listed there, This, you know, including GitHub and Google and IBM and Microsoft and Red Hat. Uh, in fact, that's just a partial list. Um, there, there's, if you go to the OpenSSF website, you'll see a much longer list. Uh, lots of organizations are now involved. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully that, con that gives you a little bit of context. And now within that, I'd like to introduce Frank uh, Frank Nagel, who will be talking about the uh, results from the report that we're uh, discussing today. Frank? Great. Thanks so much, David. So uh, thanks again. Thanks for providing us some context here. And as David mentioned, this this uh, sur contributor survey that we ran over the summer of 2020 uh, was aimed at better understanding uh, the human side of um, open source and open source security in particular. Um, Jenny, you can go to the next slide. So in particular, um, we wanted to understand uh, a lot of things, but one, the main purpose was to better understand how, why developers aren't writing uh, secure open source software from the get-go. Uh, and so we looked in particular at three um, areas. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Jenny. The first is motivations. Uh, the second is time allocation. And the third is incentives. And so we felt that these three um, together gave us a pretty good picture of, of what drives uh, contributors to contribute to open source, um, but also why they may spend their time on some areas like new features or things like that, as opposed to other areas like uh, secure, you know, uh, securing vulnerabilities or even secure coding practices from the beginning. Um, so when we um, conducted the survey, um, we'll, we'll highlight some of the, um, the results here today. Um, uh, in particular focused on these three areas. But um, if you look at the report itself, you'll see in the appendix, um, we asked a, a lot of uh, detailed questions that we kind of couldn't highlight everything here today. Um, so do take a look at the report and you'll see more in detail. Uh, next slide. 
So in particular, what we looked at um, to answer those questions was thinking about um, the demographics of uh, the contributors themselves, uh, then also you know, their current activities in free and open source software and, and how, what projects they work on, how, what they do and things like that. Uh, we also wanted to better understand the role of employers and companies in uh, the open source ecosystem. And so we asked questions about um, their employers and their uh, stances towards open source software. Uh, and then we asked uh, specifically about motivations and why people get involved in open source and why they spend their time uh, doing what they do. And then lastly, we asked about time allocation uh, to better understand how people think about um, their, uh, uh, the way that they spend their time in open source. And so um, there's the highlights in the report, but um, just to give everyone here uh, a couple of numbers, um, we, we sent uh, this uh, direct emails inviting people to fill out the survey to the, um, uh, the contributors to the top 200 projects that we identified in our, our prior work uh, that we released a report back in February. So that was kind of a targeted approach. But then we also had an open survey link that anyone could, uh, could fill out, any open source contributor. And we tried to publicize that as widely as possible through various Linux channels as, whether, as well as other um, you know, general tech media channels. Uh, and so that led to us to end up with uh, just under 1,200 responses um, that where people uh, filled out at least um, some of the, dem the demographic information and at least some of the other information. We decided that since the survey was fairly comprehensive, uh, we didn't want to force uh, everyone to answer every single question. And so about half of those 1,200 people answered every single question, um, but the full 1,200 led to uh, usable insights. And so you may see the, the number of respondents kind of change from question to question as we go through this, uh, and that's the reason why. And what was also nice uh, uh, about the way the survey was structured was that we uh, asked people uh, about their specific in, in, their involvement in specific projects. So we asked people to identify uh, the five projects, open source projects that they most um, frequently contribute to in, in any way, whether it be code commits or, or documentation or anything else. Um, and so that led to us, you know, from these 1,200 um, uh, survey respondents, we had uh, over 2,200 individual projects identified by these respondents. So obviously some were working on the same projects, but um, more than 2,200 projects uh, are represented in the, the answers to these, um, to, the, to the survey. So um, obviously it's, it's not you know, a completely representative survey, um, but we do think we have some pretty wide coverage here, which is, which is good for our ability to kind of generalize the results. Uh, next slide. So uh, before we dive in, uh, I just want to cover a few definitions because we'll use some of these as we kind of slice and dice the results of the report. Um, first of all, um, we ask people the, their level of involvement um, to, uh, uh, in a given open source project, uh, and we gave them essentially these four choices. So I'll, I'll let you read that yourself, um, but the, the four choices were in, in order of kind of highest involvement to lowest involvement, uh, maintainers, core participants, occasional participants, and then one-time participants. And so for each project that um, the respondents identified that they worked on, uh, they were contributed to, we asked them to also identify which level of involvement they had for that project. Uh, and I will point out too that uh, most of the time we'll look at uh, results at the person level, so at the contributor level. Uh, and from there, um, uh, obviously if, if somebody contributes to multiple projects, it could be a maintainer for one project and a one-time participant for another project. If we're looking at people at kind of the, the person level, we'll um, default to the highest level of involvement that they have on any project. So, um, so for example, if, you know, if somebody's a maintainer on one project and one-time participant in another, for most of the results that you'll see, they'll show up as a, a maintainer. Uh, next slide. And then the, the last two definitions um, that we wanted to, to highlight before we dive in um, are the difference between paid and unpaid contributor. Uh, so again, multiple people contribute to more than one project. And in many cases, they're paid for their, their contributions to, to one project or maybe two projects, but they also work on other projects that they're not paid for. So if you're paid for any work on, on open source on any of the projects you work on, we consider you a, a paid contributor. And if you're paid for none of the, the projects that you work on, uh, then we consider you an unpaid contributor. 
Um, so with that, let's let's dive straight into the demographics, right? Um, and so again, I mentioned we had uh, 1,200 responses total, um, but uh, for the um, uh, uh, people that answered precisely what projects and what levels they were involved in uh, was a bit less. And so for this, we, we've broken out um, the demographics based on uh, the level of participation, but also age and uh, gender. Um, so gender obviously is probably the first thing that pops off the page here. 93% of uh, these respondents were, were male. Um, I believe the full sample, it was about 91% uh, uh, that was male. So this subset is slightly higher. Um, there's, there's plenty of studies out there that have looked into uh, gender involvement in uh, open source. Um, certainly ours is, is con uh, consistent, fairly consistent with other studies that, that they have shown. Um, and so obviously our, our results are heavily male skewed, um, but that is, uh, for better or worse, is, is representative of uh, open source contribute contributors. And we've talked about um, actually some future research and future work, um, digging deeper into to why that is and to better understand how that can um, become more representative of all software developers in general. And so you can see here, uh, again, maintainers are, are overweighted, and that's partially because if you're a maintainer on any project, you show up as a maintainer um, uh, in, this, in, in this slide. Um, and so obviously there's, you know, there are some younger folks. Uh, there may be folks contributing to open source under the age of 18, but for uh, legal reasons for the survey, we had to um, uh, only allow people that were over the age of 18. Um, we also have people on the high end, uh, um, obviously fewer, um, well into their 60s and 70s working on open source. But again, you know, it's clear from, um, uh, from the results that the, at least the, the core of the respondents to the survey um, were, uh, uh, were more between the ages of 20 and say 55. Uh, and so we do have a good distribution um, of folks that are, are uh, maintainers, but also people that are core occasional and one-time developers as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, Jenny, next slide, great. Um, so yeah, so the other main demographic that we considered uh, was of course location. Um, you'll see that uh, a little over a quarter of the respondents are in the US. Um, next would be Germany with 12%, France with 7%, and the UK with 5%, and then a very long tail of, um, uh, of other countries as well. Um, so, you know, clearly um, this is a, a, a bit, you know, the, the results will be a bit more representative of the US and, and uh, Western Europe, um, but we do have, you know, some uh, good insights into folks uh, as well from, from other countries and other geographies, which is helpful. Uh, great. So, um, the one thing, you know, I meant I kind of teased this a little bit already, but we uh, wanted to in particular think about um, the, the role of, of money in open source and how that relates to security and sustainability of open source in the long term. Uh, and what we found is that over half of participants, uh, or I'm sorry, half of respondents um, reported receiving payment for at least um, one project that they work on, either from directly from their employer, the, uh, their empl direct employer was about 49% of respondents, um, or a third party, which was uh, about two to 3% of respondents said that they received payment from a third party for their involvement in open source. And of course, the other 49-ish uh, percent um, did not receive any sort of compensation uh, for a variety of reasons. And so when we think about um, this, you know, payment over uh, the countries, um, go ahead uh, to the next slide. Um, we, we can see a little bit of a, a difference in kind of the, the breakdown of, of who's getting paid uh, by country. And so obviously, you know, towards the end here, there's a smaller number of people. And so it may not be completely representative, um, but in the US, for example, of the people that said they live in the US and uh, reported whether or not they were paid for open source, about 64% of people said that they were uh, paid for at least some of their work on open source. Um, Germany, pretty close to that. Uh, uh, France, a little bit lower. But again, we're kind of getting lower in the number of responses here, so um, less easy to kind of generalize from that. Um, but we, you know, generally here see somewhere between 40 to 70% of uh, respondents from a given country um, being reporting that they're uh, being paid, although less so in India and China. Uh, but again, those numbers start to get a bit smaller and harder to interpret. Um, and so the other thing that we've uh, asked about, so this is, this is the, go ahead. Um, this is the one slide that um, we're, we looked at the project level. So as I said um, before, we, we you know, lump people, we call people a maintainer if they're a maintainer on any project. But here we wanted to break down and think about 
um, per project. Are you, what is the level of your involvement and are you paid or not for that particular project? And so clearly, you know, when we look at this, um, there is, you know, this, this kind of um, clear uh, trend that the more involved you get uh, in a given project, the more likely uh, you are to be getting paid for your work on that project. Whereas if you're just a one-time con contributor down at the, uh, at the end, um, you, you know, that's, it's kind of 50-50. Uh, and so when we think about, you know, the people and the projects that they're working on, um, obviously we have some of the higher level uh, uh, contributors um, in this survey, which I think gives us a lot um, more detailed information because one of the things that we're um, in particular kind of thinking about is how to get these folks that are the core or maintainers of projects um, to really encourage all of their uh, uh, team uh, to get more uh, security conscious. And so um, when we think about, um, you know, again, thinking about kind of money and, and the way that it is involved in the whole system, we asked about people's employment status. And as mentioned, we ran this survey over the summer. Um, so in the midst, uh, but not the height of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but the bulk of uh, respondents said that they were employed full time. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, overwhelming majority are employed full time. Um, and then the second most high, highest bar is um, the uh, uh, being self-employed or a freelancer. Um, and so again, you know, when we think about um, the, the people uh, that are contributing to open source in the old days, it was uh, assumed it was kind of all, um, you know, college students or, or things like that. Um, now we're seeing this is much more heavily represented by people that have full-time jobs. Um, and in particular, you know, we, this is, makes, makes some sense given the state of the world at the moment, um, that the skills necessary to contribute to open source are actually super highly valued in, in the general job market. Um, and so um, when we think about um, you know, uh, uh, the support for open source people, and we'll talk about this in a moment when we look at motivations, um, but most of them have a, a full-time job that you know, allows them to um, you know, pay the rent and, and put food on the table. And so when we think about um, what incentives and, and how we can change behavior in open source, is particularly related to security, um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, that notion. Uh, so the next thing we asked about um, was how people's companies, given that so many people are uh, full-time employed, um, how do their employers' IP policies relate to uh, contributing to FOSS on, on their own free time, right? So this isn't, you know, uh, are you, this is independent of are you paid or not. Um, this is just, does the company allow you to contribute, contribute to open source in your free time? Uh, and we wanted to try and get a, a sense of trends over time. And so we did ask people, um, what is the case of your employer today, five years ago and 10 years ago? Obviously, um, as you, if you look at the, the legend there, um, you see that the number of respondents kind of dwindles over time, either because people didn't remember back 10 years ago or they weren't involved, uh, you know, they weren't in the labor market at that point. Uh, and so what's clear here is, you know, the highest bars there um, are, are moving in a positive direction, right? So more and more companies are allowing their employees um, to contribute to open source on their free time. Uh, but what's slightly concerning here, the last two bars, is that even though they're, they're going in a generally positive direction, there's a still a large percentage of people who uh, believe that their company either has a very, an unclear policy towards open source, or they don't actually know what the open source policy is of their company in the first place. Uh, and so we'll revisit that towards the end. So generally, this is a, you know, a good trend that we're seeing overall, but those last two columns are a little bit concerning uh, in terms of employee awareness and clarity of uh, the company's policies. So then next I mentioned we asked about motivation. So what you'll see here um, is a list from uh, uh, of 10 uh, motivations that are often considered the, the primary reasons that people contribute to open source. Uh, and so um, when we looked at, uh, and so to prevent, you know, from survey standpoint, we showed these uh, responses in, in a random order to, to people so that they weren't just inclined to rate the first one number one and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so what we found was that uh, the, the most frequently rated number one um, uh, uh, reason uh, was um, I enjoy learning. And so 
uh, when we think about why people um, you know, contribute to open source, it's, it's this that I enjoy learning. And then the other two top reasons for contributing were that they use this piece of open source and need a specific feature, or it, uh, contributing allows them to um, scratch a creative uh, itch or they find it challenging or enjoyable. So these three highlighted in green um, were the top three, uh, most frequently in the top three of people's uh, rankings. Uh, and what's interesting is that none of these are uh, on their face, at least none of these are monetary, right? And so um, when we think about uh, uh, the motivations, uh, and especially when we want to try and tweak people to spend more time on security, uh, it turns out that at least in, in our respondents in this survey, uh, monetary uh, incentives may not be the way. Uh, and indeed, if we look at the bottom three um, uh, motivations, so these are the three motivations that showed up most frequently at the bottom of people's lists. Uh, the most frequent at the very bottom was I'm paid to develop open source. Uh, the next was that I think this will help my career uh, and then uh, valuing the recognition of my peers. And actually when we, when we looked at um, the subset of people that said they were paid to develop uh, open source. So, you know, this is, this is all people um, the way that we have it here. Um, but then when we looked at the subset of people that said that they are paid for at least some of their work on open source, um, even those folks said that payment, uh, I believe it was the, the eighth um, most uh, least likely to show up. So it wasn't quite at the bottom, um, but it was pretty darn close. And so even for the folks that are paid to develop open source, uh, that payment is not necessarily uh, uh, one of their primary motivators for their involvement in open source. So the next thing um, I mentioned that we thought a lot about was time allocation and how do people spend their time uh, on open source. And, and uh, so we asked people, you know, you can read the report and see um, some numbers around how, mu how much time per week people spend on uh, open source. But what we wanted to highlight here uh, today was how people would like to spend their time on open source versus how they actually do spend their time. Uh, and so you can see, you know, that the dark blue line is, uh, uh, is the ideal percentage of their time that they would like to spend. So, you know, if you spend 10 hours on open source, um, ideally, you on average, people would like to spend around 34% of that time um, working on new code. But in reality, uh, they actually spend less than 25% of their time on new code. And so we can see, you know, where we end up um, and getting uh, people spending more time in reality than what they would have the ideal was kind of in the middle. So maintaining projects and managing bug reports um, and then uh, administrative activities. And so in the report, we, we break this out um, by the maintainers and the core contributors. So those high level contributors um, and there, this is even more skewed for them that they're spending a lot more time than they would like uh, on these kind of maintenance and administrative tasks. Uh, and then the last thing I want to point out here that's particularly relevant to our discussion today uh, is all the way at the end there. Um, and so uh, the security uh, is, is a very small percentage uh, of people's time, both in uh, reality and what, how would they actually want to spend their time. Uh, and so this is you know, particularly concerning when we think about, as David mentioned at the beginning, uh, bugs like uh, 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 Heartbleed, sorry, had a, a brain uh, fart there. So um, Heartbleed, uh, you know, thinking about um, uh, bugs like that, um, this is a little bit concerning because we would like to see um, more time spent on security and, and perhaps even we'd like to see people have a higher level of interest in spending more time on security. Uh, but that's obviously not what we're seeing here, um, which is concerning. And we'll talk about that as we think about um, next steps and, and moving forward in our suggestions. Great. Um, and so when we, we were thinking about um, crafting this survey, one of the particular things that we wanted to better understand was how do people um, that are, are working on you know, open source projects, what types of help are they looking for? Uh, and so we asked them um, to, to say um, which of these uh, eight or nine uh, um, options are the things that would uh, most benefit the project that you work on that needs the most assistance. 
Uh, and overwhelmingly, the, the highest here uh, was bugs, bug and security fixes. Um, obviously, you know, new features and, and financial help and some other things uh, uh, come along the line as well. Um, but bug and security fixes were super high. So, so what this tells us combined with, um, you know, the prior results is that uh, people know that bug and security fixes are very important and, and, and they need to be addressed, uh, but they don't want to spend their own time working on that. Uh, and, and that's even, you know, when we consider that uh, we asked about people's security training and, and their, um, you know, development training, 40% um, of people said that they had formal training in secure software development uh, at a different point in the survey. Um, but even they, uh, uh, even they are still requesting this external help um, on bug and security fixes. And, um, you know, in the middle there, you can also see security audits. And, and obviously we kind of overweighted the help uh, requested or we got more detailed when we were thinking about uh, the security aspects because that's what we wanted in particular. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that these um, options were uh, shown up here um, helps us kind of guide um, what we're thinking about in terms of next steps and, and how we can help, we as the, as the community of, of open source uh, enthusiasts or open source users uh, can help the contributors and maintainers of, uh, the, of the projects that we use. Um, so uh, in aggregate uh, in the survey, uh, in the, the report, um, you can see it in more, more detail, but we came up with four um, suggested actions around kind of our main high level findings. Uh, so the first was related to um, this employment, uh, employed full time and, and also related to those incentives that I mentioned, or I'm sorry, the motivations that I mentioned. Um, so, you know, 75% of, of respondents are employed full time and most people, even the ones that, uh, that's, that are paid for their work on open source, say that that, that uh, payment is not uh, a primary motivator of why they're involved in open source. And so this is important when, you know, when we think about wanting to tweak behavior or, or uh, nudge people towards, in this case, spending more time on, on security, um, we have to recognize that, um, that this is, this is not, that money may not solve uh, the problem in this case, right? It, in some cases, certainly there are some projects that are underfunded. There are some contributors that would like to be paid um, for, for their work. Um, and that may be an option to, to lead them towards spending more time on security. Um, but it turns out um, that actually uh, the, um, you know, that, that may not be one of the primary ways to incentivize people to spend more time on secure, security. Uh, and so what, what needs to be done in that case uh, is potentially give external support more directly for um, security. So for example, um, when people request, you know, talked about financial support, uh, they were interested in have external people do security audits so that the contributors can keep doing what they do and, and working on the code and contributing new features and doing the maintenance. Um, but actually uh, that uh, the, the, what they need to do, um, you know, what they need for security purposes um, is external uh, audits. Um, and so the next thing uh, that we looked at, um, uh, the next thing that we looked at was also um, that notion of people not wanting to spend, uh, not wanting to and not actually spending time on security, right? So 2.8% um, on average of their time was spent on security. Um, and, you know, for, from our per per perspective, this needs to uh, increase. Um, and so in addition to funding those security audits for in particular the critical FOSS projects, um, like those that we identified in our prior report, um, but and others that um, have done similar kind of prioritization types of work, um, but also thinking about um, how do we address this from the ground up. So obviously security audits and external, you know, uh, uh, security work helps uh, address the bugs that have been inter already introduced to open source projects, um, but how do we actually in, uh, prevent those from the in the future? Um, and so one of the ways is to really help prioritizing uh, the secure software development and, and the secure software development lifecycle uh, and the best practices associated with those. Um, and so when we think about, you know, the, the role of companies and employers here, um, they, they have an opportunity to, to require their developers to actually take some training along those lines. So as mentioned, only 40% of respondents had any sort of uh, secure software development lifecycle. Um, it was slightly higher for the, the paid uh, contributors, 
um, but still room for introducing more um, in terms of incentives um, for the paid people uh, to actually take training classes related to uh, secure software development. And then also um, when thinking about um, the platforms that are hosting open source, so GitHub, GitLab, et cetera, et cetera, um, there may be opportunity or there are opportunities to actually incorporate security tools and automated automatic testing directly into uh, the development pipeline. And so um, that was one of the other recommendations that we had um, for again, kind of when we think about open source, we're trying to think about the entire ecosystem, um, not just what can any one project do themselves. So then next, um, when we're thinking about um, you know, this, this payment and the potential for um, you know, using that as a lever to, to encourage people to um, spend more of their time on security, um, uh, when we think about um, you know, the, the, um, this, this change over time, because you know, in, in the old days, um, very few people were paid for their involvement in open source, and now it's much, much higher. Um, so these companies that are paying their developers um, have the opportunities to actually um, change the way that their developers are spending their time. Um, and so one of the pieces, you know, that I think is, is important related to this employer, um, you know, uh, uh, involvement is that there might be fears that uh, large companies in particular, but even smaller companies are pushing open source in uh, directions that are either, you know, not necessarily good for, for the community um, or are overly good for uh, the company itself. And so when we think about um, you know, uh, uh, the company involvement that has been increasing over time, um, we argue that there should be ever more transparency um, related to the, this involvement and also clear commitments. Because when we think about you know, some companies that are super heavy, heavily involved in driving a particular project, um, others who may end up using that project want to know that there's going to be continued commitments to it over, the time, over time. And so um, increased transparency and also clear commitments um, we're not talking about code commitments here or code commits. Uh, we're talking about commitments to be involved and help support these projects in the future. Uh, and then lastly, um, we also think that there's opportunity here for, for mentoring. Um, and so when we think about um, uh, you know, the, the one-time people or the, the you know, occasional involvement, um, less frequently are those people actually paid, um, but they, they could use mentoring. And so this may be another way for companies that are involved in open source to contribute back to the community, not just through code, uh, but also through mentoring uh, new volunteer contributors who are not being paid for their involvement. Uh, and then lastly, also thinking about um, allowing uh, FOSS projects to be um, uh, uh, transferred uh, the ownership to uh, foundations with neutral governance um, so that you know, the, the company no longer owns the project, um, even if they're supporting it quite heavily. So then lastly, our last high level takeaway um, was the, the finding that 17.5% uh, of respondents reported that their employer had unclear open source policies. So I mentioned that before when we were talking about that. Um, and so again, despite this increasing openness of companies toward employee involvement in open source, uh, many employees are, are confused about what their company's policies actually are. Uh, and so um, we encourage companies to clarify their policies on how and when employees can contribute to open source uh, and also actually promote this contribution to open source uh, because some of our um, other research has shown that this can actually be quite beneficial for the companies and their productivity. Um, and in particular though, um, we would encourage them to uh, encourage their employees to help focus on security issues um, because these aren't the things that the free contributors want to focus on or the, un sorry, the unpaid contributors want to focus on. Uh, and so the companies have an opportunity here to encourage um, their employees to actually uh, focus on security. Uh, so with that, um, I will uh, go ahead and we'll open it up for question and answer. Um, I'll introduce um, a few other folks that were in, uh, in heavily involved in the report. Um, so you already heard from uh, David Wheeler, who's the Director of Open Source Supply Chain Security at the Linux Foundation. Um, the other co-authors on the report were Hila lifshitz Asaf, who's an Associate Professor of Information Operations and Management Science at New York University Stern School of Business. And she's also a faculty affiliate of the Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard. Also uh, involved in the report was Haley Hamm, who's a data scientist at the Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard and Jenny Hoffman, who's the Assistant Director of Research Management at the Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard. 
Uh, we have a, two additional folks um, with us from the Linux side who are integral to the effort. Um, and, uh, that's uh, Mike Dolan, who's the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Projects at the Linux Foundation, uh, and Kate Stewart, who's Senior Director of Strategic Programs at the Linux Foundation. Um, so thanks everyone for, for all your hard work on the report itself. Um, feel free to turn your cameras on and uh, so everybody can see, see your, your faces and see the, the people behind this uh, uh, voluminous report. Uh, I know the team has been answering some questions um, because uh, um, the, uh, as people rolled in, um, but I think we can kind of open up um, the Q&A. Um, and so uh, let's see, um, Jenny or David, who's been keeping an eye on the questions, um, do we have any open questions that we haven't answered yet? Um, we do, we do. Um, we actually, there, just a, a, as a, a kind of a um, housekeeping issue, uh, Hugo asked if we can share the slides. We're happy to do so. So um, we'll, we'll happily do that. Um, and then there was a question, if there's any data of contribution of students, um, like students doing intern, like an internship or a part-time job, um, to improve skill contributions. And so we, we did look at, um, uh, we did look at uh, the cross section of, of, of people at different employment statuses. So um, it's a little hard to parse out if someone has an internship um, while they're a full-time student. So we gave people uh, a, a select one out of um, employed full-time, employed part-time, full-time student, um, temporary worker. Uh, we didn't specifically ask for uh, the internship question, um, but that is, is something that we could look into for our next iteration of that. And along um, the lines too, we do um, uh, in the report, we mentioned that um, those types, you know, students uh, participating in Google Summer of Code or other projects like that um, are a great way to, to encourage people to get involved in open source from an early uh, stage. Um, but to, to make sure that um, security is being uh, baked into kind of the way that uh, those projects are, are being, um, uh, uh, you know, are being contributed to. Um, Kate, I know you've been a little bit involved in some of those efforts. Did you want to add anything to that? Sorry to stick you on the spot there. No, there's um, multiple programs and um, that people are participating in um, between the outreachy ones as well as Google Summer Code and the Linux Foundation has the Community Bridge mentorship programs. And all of these do tend to be good channels for people to get engaged in open source and then start to continue to contribute. So getting them working and engaging and realizing it's not quite so scary is, uh, you know, a really good way of pulling people in. Great, um, excellent. And uh, uh, and David, I don't know if you wanted to also mention um, a little more about the Open SSF and the the role that they're playing um, in kind of you know one one of the the things that um, we can quite highlight in the report here, but a lot of the the solutions to you know kind of the problems that are identified um, require a multi organization um, level of involvement, and so I think that um, when we when we think about the Open SSF, which just launched this summer, um, I'm curious if we wanted to just comment a little bit more about the work that they're doing and how um, you, you know as he pointed out at the beginning, there's a lot of companies that are involved in this, and it's it's an open group that others are welcome to get involved in. Um, so David, do you want to just mention um, how people can get more involved in that if they'd like to? David, you're on mute. Uh, yes, the standard phrase for 2020, you're on mute. Uh, <laughs> so um, so if, if you're interested in open source software and security, I would urge you to check out the uh, Open Source Security Foundation, the Open SSF. Uh, so, you know, that's at HTTPS colon slash slash open SSF dot org. I mean, it's simple, straightforward URLs you can get. Uh, and overall, their tagline is collaborating to secure the open source ecosystem. Uh, the last number I saw, they've got 35 organizations. In fact, I know they have more now. They've just recently joined. Um, I think that's that tagline, by the way, though, is a good summary of what the OpenSSF is all about. Uh, currently has six working groups. I'm going to read out just the names because I'm hoping that some people who are listening to this webinar and watching it uh, will say, oh, man, I'm interested in that. And so uh, let me just read that out. Uh, security best practices identifying security threats to open source projects, and that's particularly focusing on metrics, uh, securing critical projects, digital identity attestation, 
vulnerability disclosures, security tooling, um, and they, you know, and of course they may form new working groups as they choose to do so. So, you know, if you're interest, if you're interested in open source software and security, that that uh, that intersection, um, I would certainly urge anyone to, uh, you know, check out the OpenSSF. And I'd like to go back to um, another question that was asked earlier on related to contributors receiving payment by contributor status per project. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share a screen. This was submitted by, and forgive me, it's either Jan or Jan. There's no pronunciation next to it, so forgive us. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and share a screen and then pass this over to Haley. Um, and let me go ahead and share that screen now. And let me know if it's uh if it's visible it for there. everyone great yeah, thanks and for this I'll question oh thank you jenny so yeah thanks for this question because it helped me realize that i had the wrong y-axis there so um each uh as total all bars should add to 100 percent now with this new y-axis and so it's more looking at it as you know 25 ish percent of the projects are people who are maintainers and they were paid for that specific project is how you would read it. But thanks for pointing that out because it was not the correct y axis. Yeah. And we'll make sure that's correct in the report. Um, yeah. And uh, what is the what's the famous, you know, quote, it's with many eyes, all bugs are shallow, all typos are shallow. So thank you very much. And 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 we really appreciate that that um, this is part of why we're we're presenting these things. We want to make sure that we're we're getting uh, the right information out there. Um, we have another question about Dependabot, which automates security and vulnerability. And so I know that um, in some of our questions, we discussed different tools, different um, different uh, security tools that people use, and depend about was something that came up um, m very often, especially as uh, in in people's text responses. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to leave that to the other panelists. If there's any other additional um, um, question or any additional uh, insights that they had on the, on that particular. David, maybe you'd be the, you or Kate, maybe. Can help <laughs> okay, yeah, hey, I, I can jump in here a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not, a, I've done a lot of studies over the years about tools and security tools, and I'm not a believer that one tool is the one true answer, or even one kind of tool. Different kinds of tools help for different purposes. Um, the vast majority of software today is mostly reusing and combining other software. And so you need to make sure that those, that other software you're depending on, also known as your dependencies, you know, they're up to date. And in particular, if they have a known vulnerability, you need to rapidly become aware of that, update so that you can keep your dependencies updated. And so Dependabot is, is one of, of uh, several approaches, you know, several kinds of tools where it can, Tell you how to tie, tell you, hey, wait a minute, you've got a vulnerability, quickly update, uh, and so you can get updated. Now, that's not the only tool you need in the toolbox, kind of tool you need in the toolbox. Uh, I mean, uh, you need to not only be warned about vulnerable components, but generally you're going to be writing custom code and you need the other tools to help you identify the vulnerabilities in your custom code because those kinds of tools can only tell you about publicly known vulnerabilities. Um, so, you know, Absolutely, we need to use tools that detect vulner known vulnerabilities in our dependencies. Um, we need more than that, though. We need tools to help us detect vulnerabilities in the custom code. We also need to prepare, for example, to update and make changes. So, for example, a dependency tool that tells you about a vulnerable component doesn't help if your software, if you haven't developed your software to make it easy to update. So using package managers, having automated test suites. So, oh, I need to update, boom, update, tested, ship. Okay, if you can't do that quickly, uh, you've got problems. So, you know, certainly we want people to use those kinds of tools, but uh, security is much bigger than just using that kind of tool. And also I'd add in that it's also important that we have the software transparency so that we actually can find that these dependencies and things like that are there for the tools. So having improving the dependency of the software and having that automated and having it so we can track this stuff in an automated fashion is going to improve the security of the ecosystem as well. Great. 
Um, there's, a, there's a question about um, whether or not we asked contributors um, if they were involved in monitoring security attacks um, and or just responding to security incidents. Uh, so we did not ask directly about um, monitoring security attacks. We generally, when we were thinking about um, security, it was uh, uh, the, the vulnerabilities in the code as opposed to people using those uh, vulnerabilities for attacks. Um, but that could be something that um, we look into uh, the next time we run the survey. Our, our goal is to um, you know, run the survey on a yearly basis and to, to tweak it as we go because this was the first time we ran it. So um, that may be something worth looking into for uh, the next time. And then there's uh, another question about um, which companies are supporting the development of specific open source projects. Uh, Mike, did you want to weigh in on that? Um, yeah, I can, I can weigh in on that. So we didn't get into it specifically. We didn't ask uh, participants into the survey, what company do you work for? What percentage of your the code base is being developed by your company relative to others? Um, however, we do have other tools that are available to help understand that uh, relative to certain projects. Um, there are, you know, a number of tools out there that will potentially help you. Um, we use a tool at lfx.dev. So if you go to the lfx.dev website, there's an insights tool. And if you use the insights tool, you can look at uh, most of the Linux Foundation's uh, hosted projects and take a look at who's contributing what percentage of the code base under whatever time frame you want to. So you can take a look there and, and peruse through the Linux Foundation's projects. Um, you know, other foundations uh, may have similar types of tools. I think OpenStack had one, for example. Um, and uh, I'm forgetting, uh, I think uh, Eclipse might be using Baturgia's tool for being able to display some of those results. So. Um, the, the, the answers are probably out there. It's just a, a little bit harder to find, uh, but we can find that mostly through contribution history and being able to identify who was contributing from which organization. Yeah, and I'll say, I'll add on top of that, um, you know, the, as many companies have started to become much more transparent in, in their involvement in open source and, um, and some of the, the platforms are allowing that to even go further. And so for example, um, just to throw out an example, if you go to github.com slash Microsoft, uh, you can see all of the open source projects that Microsoft is involved in, um, their, which employees are contributing to those projects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, we, you know, at the end of the report, we do call for more transparency um, of, of company involvement in open source, um, but some companies are already you know, uh, going down that path, which is great. Yeah, and I think, Frank, also the financial, you know, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, you know, responses also lead us to understand for a lot of people, they have jobs, they're employed in, in you know, they're maybe using open source as a way to get that job, or they're being paid because of their skills in a particular open source project, whatever the reason, um, they are financially compensated in some way that leaves them comfortable to also contribute to other open source projects and do other things that they want to do which I thought was an interesting finding from the report. Uh, let's see, good. So just going through down, down through the questions. Um, uh, is there's a question, is there any insight in how the contributors to open source approach security in their workflow? Um, legal and licensing choice, architecture, language and compiler. Yeah, so, um, so we, we have some questions. Um, they're, they're more focused in the appendix of the report, the details. Um, what tools people actually use for security. So uh, what tools or processes people use for security. And so indeed it, it digs into some of the legal and licensing choices, um, some comp compiler choices, um, some other best practices, um, even things like the, the, the Linux um, core infrastructure initiative badging program, we asked about that. Um, and so a lot of that's in the appendix. Um, and so I encourage, uh, the anonymous attendee that asked that question um, to uh, uh, take a look at the appendix of the report in particular, because um, there's more uh, um, detail on that. Excellent. Um, <laughs> This is a, a perhaps a good uh, a good final question, but um, can each panel member take a stab at a short answer to the title question for this meeting? Uh, why can't open source developers just write secure code? Um, so uh, why don't we uh, in, in to wrap things up? Why don't we uh, go ahead and uh, we can just go round robin? 
Um, uh, so I, I can take a, a first stab, but I may steal other people's answers. But um, I do think that uh, a lot of it has to do with that um, motivations, time allocation, and incentives that we talked about. Um, and so, you know, the, they, they want to contribute, they have a limited amount of time, and they'd rather spend that time um, on, on things that they find interesting, right? And uh, on average, um, you know, many of the developers just don't find security uh, that interesting or, or you know, um, uh, kind of um, in, yeah, interesting, basically. And I will uh, say we, we didn't put it in the slides, but um, we did put a few quotes um, uh, uh, about exactly that type of uh, question in the report itself from people's responses uh, in the open-ended portions of the survey. Um, one of which uh, comes to mind that uh, somebody said that it, uh, security is essentially a, a soul wrenching, uh, un, uh, you know, necessity that they don't want to spend any time on. Another said that it's the domain of uh, lawyers and accountants, um, not, you know, uh, not software developers, which I think, you know, that in itself um, is, is a little bit concerning that that's the attitude folks have because, you know, part of the development process is ensuring that the code that you write is secure. Um, but obviously that's not necessarily the, uh, the attitude that everyone takes. Um, I'm not sure if others want to jump in on answering the title question as well. I can do a jump in here. Um, I think also we need to be seeing more tooling showing up in the CI workflows such that developers are flagged right when they commit something. If there's um, it's potentially going to hit boundaries or things like that, such that it adds another layer of um, eyes effectively in the practices when someone may not be thinking of something right off the front bat. Yeah, so I, I, if I can jump in, I, I think it's a it's a it's a valid question with a complicated answer. Um, and of course, as I mentioned at the uh, at, at the opening, it's not like the folks who are developing proprietary software have solved this problem. Uh, you know, we, we're constantly updating software every month because of security vulnerabilities. And I constantly see vulnerability reports in proprietary software. So, um, you know, I, I think there's, it's complicated, you know, uh, in some cases, lack of incentives. But I think in many folks, or many situations, part of the problem is there's other challenges, lack of education, lack uh, and difficulty in doing it. Um, education, uh, we're already working on that. Uh, you know, mentioned the Open SSF. The Open SSF just released a, a set of three courses uh, specifically on how to develop um, uh, secure software. Uh, it's free. It's actually not specific to open source, but it does uh, include open source uh, uh, discussions because that's very important when developing software in the modern world. Um, but I think, I, I think as Kate mentioned just a moment ago, a key part of this is going to be tools. Uh, I, th I think it's fair to say that uh, op developers, be it open source or proprietary, are already feeling a little overwhelmed. They're already having to do a whole lot of things already. They don't want to add vast amounts of additional time to do things like security. So what does that mean? Well, we're still going to need to have some education. Okay, that's because uh, things like tooling can't solve everything. But uh, with a little education and with different kinds of tools and brought to bear, uh, I think we can make a difference. Things like, you know, getting into the CI pipeline, uh, tools to detect problems ahead of time tools to detect dependency issues, changing our tools so that it's much more difficult to have a vulnerability in the first place. Uh, there's been quite a lot of effort to make it so that uh, programming languages and libraries uh, by default will be, you know, if you just use it the obvious way, it will be secure. In all too many situations, the obvious way is the insecure way. And if you work really, really, really hard and never make a mistake, you can make use it securely. And that's not really, desirable for anyone. So I, I, I think, I don't think there's a simple single answer, which is why you need organizations like the Open SSF uh, and others too. Um, you know, uh, folks working on SBOMs, uh, I'm sorry, uh, software bill materials and so on, basically working together to, uh, to resolve this because it's not a, look, there's, you do this one thing and it's all solved. Others? Um, no, no, I just, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Jen. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, I think you can say the same things uh, about, you know, why 
we know that diet and exercise helps keep us healthy and, and, and happy. Um, but I don't know about you guys. I'm still sitting on that couch and, you know, binging Netflix. So I think it is, you know, as we create more nudges like we do for, for social, other social behaviors, um, I think, and a lot of what we, we try to suggest are these nudges, these um, behavioral nudges from um, employers, from projects themselves, um, from thought leaders in, um, in open source. And that's what we're trying, you know, we're trying to do. But just as, just as it's something that we've, we've always struggled with every New Year's, um, I think it's, I think this is something that's going to be uh, a sticky wicket for many years to come, but it doesn't mean it's not worth um, still kind of chipping away at every, uh, every chance we get. Yeah, know, right? as David pointed out, uh, the, the nudge book, it's, it's definitely worth a read. Uh, Hila, did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah I had a chance. Yes, I wanted to say, uh, to add on what David said on how the community thinks about security and the quote that you brought is really important. The fact that someone does not think that security is part of what they need to do, right? So from my studies of Wikipedia, which is different, but has some similarities, I think it is important to think uh, of this report is kind of saying, look, this is something we need, we need to think differently about because so far it's not being taken care of. So one way is to make the tools much easier and in Wikipedia they have invested a lot in making bots and things that will make it now. It's, it's unbelievable the, the, how fast it is compared to how it was a few years ago to fix uh, all kind of uh, you know, crazy stuff that used to happen in Wikipedia and now hardly do. If you think about Wikipedia back in the day, it wasn't reliable because of it. So I don't think open source has that threat that Wikipedia had to deal with uh, on the reliability, but it is something important that we need to think of and, and not to take um, as something that is external to the community and its ethos. So I think it's something that the community wants to think of. This is important to us. It is part of what we want to do and make better. So what uh, David is saying about the institution and how we should take part of it, I think is something that we need to, to think more also, how do we make security part of what makes open source great and not just like something external, more of um, to learn from other communities that have done it. Great. I will, I will defer my time because I, I think the panel's covered pretty much all the, all the thoughts I had, Frank, so. Great. All right, um, David, I think we'll give you the final word. Uh, 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 there were one or two things we wanted to make sure we mentioned. You're still on mute. <laughs> I'm trying to be gener uh, generous to others to, and not interfere. Uh, so anyway, so um, I would, of course, encourage people to look at the report. Uh, I think we're going to uh, tweak that uh, y-axis that we mentioned. Um, but, uh, you know, the reports raise news questions. We're hoping to do another survey um, in next year. So if you see that, when you see the announcement, if you're a contributor, please participate. Uh, if you're interested in open source and security, I would encourage you to uh, get involved in the OpenSSF, OpenSSF.org. I mentioned the CI Best Practices badge. If you're contributing to a uh, open source project, uh, you know, uh, by all means, uh, work on that. And I think the broader issue here is, you know, the world depends on open source software. So, you know, if you're interested in collaborating with with uh, the OpenSSF or anyone else, we would love to hear from you. Um, and uh, just find ways to uh, contribute. So thank you very much. Great, thanks everyone. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. Thank you right. for all of, uh, of those that fill out the survey. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks all.